been learning myself recently, which has been a bit of a revelation to me, to do with the history of the conservation movement and its roots in racism, colonialism and eugenics, basically. And a lot of this um, is inspired by Stephen Corey, who's in, in charge of this organisation called Survival International, which are brilliant. They're fighting for indigenous people's rights all over the globe. And um, little bits that have been borrowed from his speech at my conference about race equality in nature last week, just because he is such a good speaker, basically. Um, so I guess I'll start with the fact that I think most people are aware to an extent that conservation, that conservation excludes lots and lots of people and it is seen as this very elite thing. And um, the first thing I want to talk about really is the conservationists that we sort of <coughs> revere in our society. And it's Darwin and Wallace who travelled the world collecting, which is basically a euphemism for shooting, thousands and thousands of birds and sending these specimens back to the Natural History Museum as um, birds which were new to man, which they were not, they were new to Europe. And um, Darwin was obsessed with killing. He killed hundreds of birds for sport, for enjoyment, um, which obviously to an extent was common at the time, but it was far more than anyone else. And it was even during this period, people would comment on how many birds he would shoot. And um, Wallace wasn't particularly a sports hunter, but he did like money. So that's why he killed hundreds of birds. So this idea of them being conservationists, protecting birds and animals all over the globe is just not true because one had a lust for birds and the other one had a lust for money. And in, I suppose what we call them now is a trophy hunter and a commercial hunter. But the start of the actual conservation movement can be traced back to the 1860s. Um, and the foundations of this conservation sector and how racism is perverted from the very beginning starts around this date. And so Teddy Roosevelt, who was the president of the USA at the time, was a trophy hunter along with his friends. But he noticed an issue where these herds, these massive herds of animals that he loved shooting were starting to, to decline. And um, he decided to trace this decline in species, not back to the fact that he and his friends, people in his social class, were killing literally hundreds of these animals, but to the fact that Native Americans um, were on this land and um, hunting these animals for subsistence. And um, he said that these Native Americans who had lived here for thousands of years and knew exactly how to look after the land, didn't know how to nurture and to preserve it, and that instead they needed to be removed from this land, and instead two national parks should be formed, Yosemite National Park in California and Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming. And John Muir, who's seen as the father of conservation in the US and in the world, supported this decision and so these Native Americans were forcibly removed from their land. And this was at the time of the Native American Wars, when the military were used to confine these populations, these tribes of Native Americans, to reservations, which were basically little more than prisons. And um, a lot of it, even though it was to do with these wars, this sort of unspoken part of history, but was to do with these trophy hunters that wanted these subsistence hunters gone from their land. And um, it's a very common theme in colonialism, to be honest. These oppressors coming along, deciding that they want the resources on the land, they want the land itself, and removing the people who have lived there for thousands and thousands of years. And I genuinely think that these people, these people who are seen as founding the conservation movement should be seen for who they really are, um, who are enemies of conservation itself, and men who are self-serving to themselves and their class. And um, another 
very early conservationist was a man named Madison Grant, who was a close friend of Roosevelt. And one of the things he's most famous for these days is um, lobbying in 1906 as secretary of the New York Zoological Society to put Ota Benga, a Congolese man from the Mahuti people, on display um, alongside the apes at Bronx Zoo. And he also wrote a book that was incredibly popular called The Passing of the Great Race. The Great Race being um, Nordic white people. And it was all about eugenics and how these Eastern Europeans and these black people and these Asian people and all these immigrants were going to come and take over to the point where the great Nordic race was going to disappear and become impure. And um, this book was greatly admired by Hitler. Um, and at Nuremberg, it was they, one of their arguments used to defend themselves was that they were just applying the um, the eugenics, which was very popular in the US at the time, um, where they were doing um, widespread forced contraception and forced abortion and forced sterilization um, to keep the population of North, um, Native Americans and immigrants down. Um, and that's in the 1860s, but the exact same thing is happening today, where in Africa and some parts of Asia, um, there's this concept that these native, these indigenous peoples don't know how to look after their land, which if you sit down and think about it for more than two seconds, just doesn't make sense. And um, there's this idea that these white people from, I don't know, Europe and America, they're the ones that know how to do proper conservation. And there's this whole thing to do, this dichotomy, I suppose, between trophy hunters and poachers. And the main difference between them these days is race, because trophy hunters are rich and white, and poachers, or a lot of who they claim are poachers, are people who have been removed from these lands that are trying to hunt for food, which they have been doing um, the whole time that their people have been there. And this conservation model has terrible, terrible impact for the people that they are removing. An example is Salonga National Park in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where 700 indigenous communities were evicted from their land to make space for um, a national park in 1970. And this park was created without compensation and where human rights abuses were committed um, by WWF park rangers in order to punish people entering the park, entering their own lands. And in Africa, there is not a single protected area where local people have not been excluded from their land. For example, in Congo, again, they are beating up the local Baka people in a national park called Mesotja, um, or the so-called pygmy people, where rangers will beat and torture and rape and sometimes kill these indigenous people for coming onto land for subsistence, while people from America are paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to fly over and shoot these same animals, and it's perfectly legal. And um, some of these really massive, really famous national parks in Africa are the same, such as Dago, um, which the local community were elephant hunters um, and they were removed in the 1920s by the British. And at some point, nearly half of the entire population was in prison for so-called poaching. And a lot of this comes back to the fact that humans are seen as completely removed from nature, but they're not. And these um, local communities had been maintaining the elephant number, the elephant population, through subsistence hunting for hundreds of thousands of years. And when they were removed, when there was a drought, um, the elephant numbers had increased to the point where they could no longer be supported and they were using up more resources than they could. And huge, huge numbers of elephants ended up starving to death because there were just too many of them. And the, the natural balance in these places is destroyed by removing these people. And um, an issue recently came up in Botswana um, about trophy hunting elephants, where um, 
the press all around the world, the media was going on about how dire it was and was full of really quite racist commentary about um, these black pe people in Africa who don't know better and these white saviors from America who are coming over and showing them how to do it. And um, things like this really exacerbate um, sort of racist attitudes towards people in these areas when a lot of the time it's not their fault. And this example in particular, I remember seeing an incredible amount of really quite racist comments under nearly all of the articles that I read. And um, like I said, a lot of this is to do with how even though we in the West don't think of this at all, a lot of wilderness has been created by man. Um, like for example, the Amazon is seen as one of the most wild places in the world, untouched by humans. But in reality, it's been maintained by the people who live there for thousands of years, um, where they've been cutting down trees in certain areas, or like planting certain plants for their crops, or like um, all the other things that they do. And we just don't see it like that because we haven't done what we did in England, for example, where we chopped down everything immediately because they have this understanding of um, working together with the earth, which people just can't seem to wrap their heads around a lot of the time. And um, the African grass plains are another example of this, where these grass plains have been created by for thousands of years, these um, tribes of herders taking their um, cows, like, all, like their massive herds of cows, across these grass plains until all that remains is grass. And um, when the British first went to Australia, they commented that it looked, it reminded them of home. It looked like a massive park with these fields of grass. Um, but within a few generations, no one ever said anything like that at all because there had been this realization that that wasn't just what Australia looked like. The Aboriginal people had created Australia to look like that. They had these massive fields of crops and these fish farms and these villages made out of stone. And so they refused to acknowledge that other people around the world can have civilizations better um, than the ones they had at home. And um, so they have been sort of destroying this perfectly balanced <coughs> ecosystem that has been maintained for so long. And it's had really quite disastrous <coughs> implications for conservation as a whole actual conservation, not the conservation sector. And um, conservation in Africa and parts of Asia is still viewed with a huge amount of hostility by the local people, and with good reason, because to them, it's seen as this Western force that swoops in and takes away their food sources and removes them from their land. Um, and it sort of brings up this question, why aren't they removing people from English national parks, for example, why are we still allowed to live there? And it's because in England there were there are powers and laws protecting us. And um, globally, they don't target all the indigenous peoples. They go for the ones that are low in numbers and have very little political power that can't put up sufficient resistance. For example, in the 1960s, when they made Everest into a national park, they didn't remove the Sherpa population because they were part of the British military. They were the, and they couldn't rem remove the famous Gurkhas um, because there would have been a worldwide uproar because they were seen as part of Everest. They were famous. Um, but in places like um, the Congo, they're still doing it to this day. Even other places within Nepal, there are horrific human rights abuses happening. Um, so I guess this brings up the question of what conservation needs to do to fix this. And I think it all comes down to bearing in mind that the local people have been maintaining the land and the wildlife for tens of thousands of years, and they know how to manage it. And they know, for example, when genuine poachers are coming in and trying to kill these animals, and they can spot them and know where they are. And if you actually want to conserve an area, 
the last thing you want to do is remove these peoples because what these organisations really need to do, which is why it's very unlikely it's ever going to happen, is have, they have to go in and talk to them and interact with them as equals and say, we have our resources and our money, um, what do you think we should do? Um, and although it's obviously a really complicated situation, um, it's just completely unthinkable to these organisations because um, Stephen Corey was saying, when someone put this to people very high up in organisations like the WWF, he was told that the last thing that would happen was that conservation organisations would work with the local indigenous people, genuinely, not just um, on a very surface level way that makes people soften up to the idea of conservation in these areas. And it's because conservation these days isn't about conserving animals, it's all about power and it's all about money. Um, but the reason they have power and the reason they have money is because people around the globe support them and what they're doing because they don't know, they don't understand. And so if enough people tell them to change, they have to. And um, this image, this like cuddly panda, is viewed as a colonial oppressor in the places where it's genuinely working. And conservation is racist. Like, that feels slightly uncomfortable to say, but conservation is racist. It is rooted in racism. And if you want to change, you have to tell these organisations, these massive organisations, that it won't be tolerated. And these organisations are owned by corporates not by people who genuinely want change. They're owned, the people on their boards are people like arms manufacturers and big farmers and big oil companies and things like that. And they're not there because they care about conservation. They're there because that's where the money is. And things need to change because of the injustice of it all and because the way that conservation is happening at the moment just doesn't work. It's not helping, it's not conserving. And if you want it to, if you do want it to work, you have to put indigenous people in the um, in the driving seat, basically, of conservation. But I think another, sorry, another issue that ties into this is a lot closer to home, and it's to do with this idea in the UK and America and other countries like that that minority ethnic communities don't care about nature and they don't want to engage with nature, um, which is particularly shocking because most of these people who have come over to England, for example, even just their grandparents grow up in incredibly rural places, tiny little villages where they were completely surrounded by nature and it was sort of intrinsically part of their identity. And people now have been sort of convinced that their identity is that of urban people and um, so I've been doing a lot of work because of obviously my personal um, experience with the environmental sector. I'm half Bangladeshi and when I grew up I literally almost never saw anyone that looked like me out in nature except obviously my mum and my sister and um, a lot of the work I've been doing, it sounds very simple but has been around the idea of understanding that people can engage in nature in different ways. Um, and not everyone is interested in putting on a pair of binoculars and going down to the local reserve to look at like little brown birds, you know? It's just not interesting to a lot of people. And you need to find another way that they can do it. And um, I have been doing these nature camps um, down at Sunset Levels. I don't know if people know what that is, but it's this massive gorgeous nature reserve and I've been just getting teenagers from like inner city Bristol, minority ethnic teenagers and taking them camping for a weekend and giving them the opportunity to have these new experiences um, with nature and I have done nine of them now and even though I constantly have people telling me that it's not an issue with the with the environmental sector, it's an issue with these people, they just can't be engaged with nature. 
I have not had a single child, a single teenager come on one of these camps and not engage with nature in some shape or form. And um, one of the ways that I have been doing this is talking about something that I call nature by stealth, which is basically, again, playing with this concept that not everyone wants to engage with nature in the same way. So, for example, if I did a filmmaking, I did a filmmaking workshop in Eastern Qatar, and I got those of those teenagers coming on, about 30 of them, just from the local area, and it just happened to be that the thing we were making films about that day was the nature that they could find in the park, and immediately, like, it was 10 times more interesting to them. And, um... I don't know, like, even though these camps are very, very important to me, and they are making a difference at a grassroots, le grassroots level, when I had done a couple of them, I wanted to know what was going on in the bigger picture, what people who actually had power were doing. So I wrote to some of the big nature NGOs in the UK, like the RSPB and WWT and people like that, saying, what are you doing? How are you engaging with people? And um, they all wrote back and they were really lovely and they didn't really answer my question, but they were like, we want to hear what you, a 13 year old child, have to say about this issue. Um, so they all invited me up to speak to various people at their various headquarters all around the country um, during that autumn, but I couldn't because I had school, which apparently had not crossed their minds at all. So I decided to bring them all together so that they could talk to each other and actually get people from these communities to tell them what the issues were instead of them asking me, again, a 13-year-old child, what I thought the issues were. And my parents sort of, they sat me down and they told me that that was called a conference. So I decided to have a conference to ask what these people were doing. And um, I will say, spoiler alert now, not a lot. Um, so between me deciding to organize it and it actually happening, some really interesting research <coughs> published. Because another thing I have people telling me a lot is it's not um, an issue to do with race. It's nothing to do with that at all. We live in a post-racial society, no one cares about race. It's all about um, class. And it just happens to be that lots of um, minority ethnic people are lower or working class in the UK. Um, and this research proved that it wasn't to do with class, it was everything to do with race. Because regardless of class, white children were going out into green spaces, not even nature, green spaces, so like the local park, um, nearly 20% more than minority ethnic children. And um, at the same time, people finally started publishing numbers after years of pressing, and it was revealed that less than 1%, 0.6% of the environmental sector was minority ethnic. And this um, is actually BME, so it includes things like Irish, Eastern European, so not even um, visually minority ethnic, but any type of minority in the UK. Um, so then, I had my conference and it was really interesting um, because the concept of going into these communities and ask, actually asking <coughs> people what the issues were instead of sort of muttering amongst <coughs> themselves like all oh, this problem was sort of completely new to, to these organisations. Um, and I was talking to them after and they said that nearly every single thing that they heard about they just never even considered before. And um, it was a real mix of barriers, to be honest, and obviously it's a bit generalised because um, for every community of people it's going to be different, but it was really, really varied from things like people, lots of people within these communities not having suitable clothes to go outside in like English weather, um, to people viewing the countryside as white and elitist and they didn't want to go out there because they were worried that something would happen to them. And um, we tried to come up with some solutions as well, and a lot of it came down to encouraging people to get jobs in the first place, so talking to parents, making them understand there are things except, um, you know, the usual doctor, um, and sorry, I'm having a mind blank, but you know, all the like usual traditional jobs which are seen as really stable, that will make sure that you have a good life, that um, going into, the nature sector can be one of those, um, and <coughs> helping 
people in these communities understand that if their children do want to go on and do like a, a zoology degree instead of a medicine degree, then that's going to set them up. <coughs> and um, again, just making nature more relevant to these people. Like personally, I know lots of people that they don't they don't really care about what they perceive as like little brown birds in the UK. But if someone starts talking about like the amazing mangrove forests in Bangladesh and the tigers that live out there and all the amazing wildlife, they'll like they'll be interested because it's where they like build their <coughs> roots from. And um, obviously, I think another example is the youth strikes and things like that. Like people galvanizing around a genuine issue that's going to affect everyone. Like um, the numbers still aren't great, but like I said, things like youth strikes and extinction rebellion have managed to like engage more people than anything before them. And um, so after this conference, I gave them a big list of things they needed to do basically. Um, and it's basically all coming down to this idea of listening to people instead of telling people what to think. So engaging with people in their spaces, engaging with people in what their idea of nature is, helping them to go outside in a way that they want to instead of a way that you're telling them. Um, and also just getting an, a true understanding of um, how <coughs> bad the issue is, which is um, monitoring within your own organisation which they had, are still, um, three years later, refusing to do. Um, oh, sorry. Um, I've run out of slides. Uh, so, um, that was all very well and good, but that was in 2016, and not a lot was ha happening. I have been doing this stuff for nearly five years now, and I have seen such minimal change within the sector that is painful. Um, but I decided to have another follow-up conference last week, um, inviting all these people back and saying, what have you done? Not a lot. What are you going to do? Um, and it was a little bit harsher than the last one because I think genuinely, as a minority ethnic person, sometimes it's very hard to tell people to just shut up and listen and to do what they're told instead of just saying, well, maybe you should do this or it would be quite nice if you did this. Um, and I have also started fighting back against tokenism a little bit because, so I couldn't understand for a long time why things weren't changing because I was going in and I was talking to these organisations and I was doing loads of talks and I thought that people were listening but they weren't, they, they were pointing at me and going, see, times change, um, while not actually doing a lot and it's only probably in the last six months or so that I have suddenly started very slowly to see the ideas which I've been shouting about for years quietly parroted back at me when I ask people what they're doing. Um, so I think maybe, maybe I'm being optimistic, but maybe it's a sign that things are going to change in the future <coughs> and that this opportunity to engage with green spaces, with the environment is going to be open to everyone within the UK and that as our environmental crisis gets worse and worse, um, we're going to have a larger group of people who cares because they know what they're fighting for. Thank you.